Great. And we are beginning our panel, who will be composed, as you know, of Professor Uman, Miki Haram, Rafael Tognata, and Bob Watson. And me, who will be moderating the panel. I don't have much to say to open that panel because I am afraid that all of you are part of the public awareness that brought us here. <coughs> the timetable for solution is running short. Actually, when we talk about environment, uh, it's such a huge question that we are not talking only about climate change. Climate change is practically is the effect, is not the cause, and we are here to hear some of the solutions. And that's what we are after. Then we are also here to hear, to try to find out where is the position of Israel vis-a-vis -vis the systemic crisis that the planet is going through. Basically, we have practically three systemic crises, one of the other. <coughs> we have the crisis on the economic model, we have the crisis on environmental <coughs> impact, we have a crisis on increased poverty and social syndromes. And aside from that, we are finding that we have an inadequacy of the political movement, of the political matrix, either democratic or autocratic, to resolve in good terms and propose the procedures that will be necessary to overcome the crisis. We are not dealing with a national crisis anywhere. We are dealing with a global crisis. So this is just an introduction. So now we are going to hear first Professor Puman. Please, Professor. Hello. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here because uh, the uh, environmental crisis Yes, we're not going to have any uh, coral reefs. 
setting on everything. The oceans are filling up with garbage. How do you prevent people from doing that? Well, you can say, be good, try to uh, uh, not to create so much garbage, uh, be aware of the environment. Yeah, but all that, it, it falls on deaf ears. It doesn't make any impact on anybody. In Switzerland, they found the right solution. In Switzerland, what they do is, they say, you are not, you cannot throw out garbage wherever you want. There's a special place in every neighborhood, quite frequent places for de de depositing garbage. And they will not accept the garbage unless it is placed in special bags. You can throw out as much garbage as you want, but you have to put it in a special bag. And that special bag costs five Swiss francs. That's it. That's all. Five Swiss francs. Yeah. Okay. Now do what you want. Be my guest. Yes. As he can produce as much. Now what happens is that of course is five Swiss francs is money. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Especially if you're going to throw out uh, uh, three, four of those bags a day, it starts adding up. Yeah. So people. Pay attention to that. And then what it does is they go to the supermarket and they buy those things which are not, don't have all that tremendous amount of packaging, yes? So the things that have a tremendous amount of packaging, they're not going to get bought in the supermarket. So the manufacturers take into that into account and they make stuff which doesn't have all that packaging, right? So it's the incentives. They go from one place to the other. The incentives make the thing work. So in Switzerland, there isn't that much garbage, yes? It's not that the Swiss government wants to make revenue out of these bags, but they want to prevent people from throwing out so much. This is a, one lovely example. Let me give you another example, because uh, um, incentives can work the other way also. You, know, you, you, can, you can have incentives which uh, here we have incentives to do the right thing. There's also incentives to do the wrong thing. Let me tell you a story. In Nepal, up to about 20 years ago, there were, in southern Nepal, there were beautiful jungles. Yes. And the jungles had tigers in them. And they had thousands of species of birds and, and God only knows what. They had a beautiful jungle. All right. Poor kids, what do you want? All right. Now, uh, but there was one species among all those species which was also there. God made it. It's the Anopheles mosquito. Okay? So these jungles were infested with malaria. Okay? So you went there under your own risk. And also if you took the malaria pills, yes? Uh, all right. Well, the government of Nepal said jungles are beautiful things, but malaria is terrible. Lives are lost because of malaria, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to drain the swamps. We're going to drain the swamps, and we're going to get rid of the anopheles mosquitoes, but we'll leave the tigers, we'll leave the orchids, we'll leave everything. Okay, great. Right? So that's what they did, and they eliminated the anopheles mosquito. As soon as they eliminated the anopheles mosquito, there was no longer any malaria there. There was no longer any malaria. Lots of people in that found lots of people, yeah? So they started looking for room. They went to a little corner of the jungle, and they burnt it down, okay? And they built a house and a farm there. And then somebody else came to another little corner of the jungle. Today there's no jungle in southern Nepal, okay? So this great thing of saving lives by eliminating the anopheles mosquito, it turned out to give the wrong incentives, right? Okay? Now, I think no amount of Kyoto protocols, no amount of, uh, of, of, um, of, uh, 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 how do you call it, guidelines for what, what, what levels we have to reach by this or that, all that stuff is not going to work. Yeah, it's not going to work. You have to give people incentives. And you have to give... The governments have to give the people the incentives, and the and we.
we have to give the government the incentives, yes? In other words, the, the international community has to see to it that the government has incentives to meet those guidelines, to meet those goals. How do you do that? Well, you say, okay, you say, we, we give you aid, this and that. The aid is directly tied to the amount by which you exceed the goals or do not exceed the goals. Don't make it a yes or no question. It's got to be a question of, like, like the Swiss garbage bags. It has to be, you pay for it. You, you uh, exceed your goal by this and that amount, you get this and that amount of aid. It has to be directly tied. And, uh, and then the governments themselves will have incentives to give the people incentives to do the right thing. Thank you very much.
really huge part of the, of the population of the Earth. And in our area, in the Middle East, it's definitely going to be a cause for uh, war, not only here, it can be, it's always part of all the skirmishes, all the, all the battles, all the uh, uh, different interests that countries have. So besides the fact that it's really uh, a danger to human life, it all, always behind all the wars that we have, so that there is another uh, another problem and another crisis, and it doesn't seem to get any better. Uh, as I said, in many places all over the world, environmental issues are behind it. If you get the desertification, you, you can the, into the cities. Uh, poverty becomes much worse. You can see it in Africa. You can see it uh, in. Uh, in many places uh, all over the world and in the Middle East, the water issue is going to be a very serious uh, problem. Uh, in Israel itself, if we look about the temperature, we can see that the temperature are going up, but I'm not going to, to go into it, it's just a graph to show that it's here already, all the, pro the, the problems of climate change in Israel as well, and we, as part of the world, we have the same, uh, the same problem, but our big problem I think, or, or I don't know if it's a main world, but definitely it's something that we have to find uh, an interesting solution. It's not a simple problem, is uh, the, the population density. When we look at it like that, as it is, we are one of the most uh, populated uh, countries in the world. And this part doesn't mean anything because it is only to the southern desert part. Uh, actually, if we look, let's say, at Negra, we have 6,000 uh, people uh, per, per kilometer. And we are actually definitely one of the most densely populated countries in the world, definitely in the Western world. When you have countries like that, you have a problem up to the water sources, especially if they are people are living above uh, the water sources in Israel. You have a problem of energy. Uh, if we would have to triple the amount of energy that we're having, uh, that we're having today, in not too many years, then how can we fight against uh, a whole? Uh, uh, human power to tap, it's difficult because if we need three times what we have right now, where are we going to get that? Even if we will use uh, sources that are good. So, uh, that we're uh, not forgetting. So, definitely, we have here a problem that we have to take care of. The water problem is here. This is just one example. There are many examples. This is the water that goes into the Kinneret, one of the three main sources of water in Israel. This is how the clean air looks today. This is how it looks in 92. Just one place where it looks. We are losing water. More people, they need more water, they need more energy. Desalination is a nice uh, solution, but it's not good enough because it needs a lot of energy. So this is not going to give us a solution. It's good in a few more year, years ahead, but it's not as a solution uh, for the future. Uh, we are talking about water consumption in Israel. Actually, Israelis are not losing very much water per, per person. So, it, uh, saving, and even if we give them the incentives that we're given, it will help a little bit, but it's not going to change the big picture. Because we are not wasting so much. Actually, when it comes to energy, we do waste. As you can see here, uh, when we look at carbon dioxide that is emitted to the, to the uh, air, uh, in Israel is definitely can, uh, can say and be like other European countries that is use less energy or use it a lot more efficiently and here we do need incentives. Definitely one of the ways to make that situation a little better, but as I said it's good for the 10 years ahead but not as the final solution. Where is the final solution? Although I am uh, not sure, uh, you know, you can't predict the future as everybody says, I think that the solution should be looked at scientific solutions. And the most important thing is when we talk about water, there is not enough water to have enough food for all the people in the world. That means war and trouble. If we don't solve that problem, we don't have a solution. How do we solve it? We need genetic engineering or other solutions where you can have plants for food uh, that, uh, that uh, um, yeah, this is actually the solution, I would say a few more words about that solution. You need uh, to be able to have plants for food with less water than what we did until now, with, uh, with uh, maybe saltier so the water, and that, that way we have to do it uh, with, uh, it should be a scientific, uh, scientific 
solution. I say that mitigation and adaptation are necessary, but they're not enough. We need the research and development. I just gave a few uh, uh, companies that are working on that in Israel. We heard yesterday that the Prime Minister said, let's have a committee that will decide about uh, the solution to an adult type committee. They should put money into it, not committees, decision together with the solution should go into it. Maybe not Israel by itself, but definitely Israel can start, and we can have a scientific center here, one about water, food, that's the most important thing. The other one is about um, energy, and of course, the rest of the other things are important. country 
countries uh, will not have. And then there is the other cluster of, com of countries, uh, the new emerging countries with uh, other kinds uh, of problems in terms of uh, economic uh, growth, uh, but with an importance uh, that is uh, increasing strongly, and this will lead for sure uh, to interesting uh, uh, dialogues and interaction with the countries of the first uh, cluster. Here uh, we, uh, we can find in the next uh, two or three slides some uh, uh, comments on, uh, uh, on the different uh, policies, uh, on, the, on the different sensitivities that we now are experiencing in the, in the countries. First of all, the United States. Uh, Barack Obama seems really to be very sensible, uh, finally on, 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 on green energy, uh, there are uh, some projects uh, and um, I think uh, there is really an interesting run now for green energies uh, in, uh, in the United States. Uh, the situation then uh, in, uh, in Europe uh, uh, is well known too, even if there is some struggle about uh, uh, the so-called uh, European energy trilemma, that means uh, to find the right uh, way to define incentive schemes uh, uh, to have a competitive market, to have security of supply, and to have a low carbon environment. And uh, we experienced uh, in uh, Europe uh, several trials uh, in terms of incentive schemes. Uh, and the problem, as we can see here, uh, is that uh, it is really difficult uh, to coordinate uh, and finally, we say to avoid uh, speculation uh, uh, consequences on this kind of incentive schemes. This is one of the big issues uh, in Europe for the time being. And this leads uh, to what we can see here in these slides. In fact, uh, the problem that uh, the different European countries uh, have uh, uh, different starting points uh, and have a common goal in terms of Europe. Uh, but then the implementation in the single countries uh, is really something uh, very complex in terms of, of efficiency. So it is a uh, uh, common understanding now that what finally is needed here is uh, a global uh, coordination in terms of uh, uh, granting uh, the, 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 the objectives that were defined. So, uh, now, we have seen uh, there is already uh, a little bit of history in the incentive schemes uh, on uh, the renewable energies. Uh, but uh, the problem now is uh, to see uh, what kind of uh, impact can have uh, the, uh, the crisis. And uh, uh, what is, uh, what is uh, for sure is that there, what, there is a big disruption for the first time this year in terms of uh, electricity worldwide, for the first time there is a, a decrease uh, of, uh, of the consumption. And this will, will lead, uh, in our opinion, uh, to three opportunities. The first one is that definitely we have to talk about energy efficiency. The second one is that uh, uh, there is uh, an opportunity again for renewable energy and then uh, to uh, find solutions for carbon-free uh, technology. So, uh, I will skip this, uh, uh, this is uh, a summary of uh, the objectives uh, as today are defined uh, in the different uh, regions of the world. Uh, so this, this, this should be the results uh, of the incentive schemes that are discussed now and that uh, the different authorities are trying to implement uh, overall in the world. And uh, I would like to go to the, directly to the conclusion. Uh, to the conclusion, uh, which is, uh, in our opinion, uh, that uh, the crisis uh, can be really an opportunity uh, for uh, the uh, renewable contribution to the uh, worldwide energy mix. And uh, um, there was, uh, in the last year, uh, in, uh, in a, a strong increase in terms of, uh, uh, of uh, new plans and in terms of development 
think that it is not so useful to have uh, incentives uh, in terms of uh, uh, market remuneration of tariff uh, system, tariff mechanism. It is more important really to invest in, uh, in research and development in, uh, in the technologies for the solar. That's what we are trying to do, uh, for instance, uh, with a program that we decided to finance on uh, research in solar organic. Uh, this is one of the challenges we want to follow to change uh, our uh, business from an oil to a multi energy company. Thank you for your attention.
Uh, the experts say, we even made coffee. There was not much thought of danger. That was the expert. That was the engineer who looked at the gash inside of the Titanic. And here are some of the responses of the passengers. Many passengers did not believe that the ship was sinking. How many of us actually think that our SS life as we know it is sinking? And they refused to board the environmental life raft because they did not want to be out in the middle of the frigid ocean on a tiny little lifeboat when the big, safe boat was sinking. Okay? It wasn't until the last five minutes. This is an event that was going on steadily for three and a half hours. And yet it wasn't until the last five minutes that people really believed that the light boat, the, the, the big boat was going down. So, you know, uh, we need a paradigm shift because that is the only answer. Changing the way we think at its very core is the only way. I mean, I could talk for days on policy mechanisms, things that have worked in cities and states and national governments, uh, technical solutions. We could talk about that for a week. And none of it will make any difference until we change the core paradigm of how we think. And when I talk about a paradigm change, back in uh, you know, a few hundred years ago, Tal the Ptolemaic universe, Aristotle, uh, it was the Earth was at the center of it. So if we think that egonomics is what I call it, is at the center of our human existence and our human decision making, that is the Ptolemaic universe. And everything revolves around economics. Now, unfortunately, we had the modern day version of. We've had many of them, but sort of the more popular version of Copernicus, the inconvenient truth that Al Gore talked to us about, where, no, in fact, the sun is at the center of the universe and that the earth revolves around it. Now, we have seen, during this transition, the 200 years it took people to go from the Ptolemaic universe to the concept of the Copernican universe, it took 200 years, and there were many uh, forms of uh, sort of trying to justify that the Earth was still the center. Tycho Brahe was probably the most famous one. And if you can sort of see, there's uh, a lot of dipsy doodles between all of the planets that were trying to fit the paradigm of the Sun, the, the Earth at the center, yet at the same time explaining the movement of the planets. And again, I would argue that this is, uh, this is uh, price and carbon, this is uh, externality adders, this is Kyoto, this is. None of this is going to work um, because uh, egonomics at its center, this 18th century conception of Adam Smith, separates the impact of the transaction from the transaction itself. So until there is no separation, until economics, economics revolves around chemistry, biology, and physics, we will never ever have sufficient incentives to fit in with the flows of the planet. So if we were to look objectively at powering our, uh, our you know, world, we have a finite, limited, uh, found in limited location, uneven distribution, dirty fuel source that's dangerous to extract. We would say, hmm, that's not a good thing. And yet when we compare it to an inexhaustible uh, resource that is found everywhere, uh, and it's much more evenly distributed, it's clean, and it's safe, well, objectively, which one would we say is cheaper? Okay, we would obviously take the right-hand column and say objectively that's a cheaper resource. But the sun, we can't possibly put that into place because it's too expensive. Okay, now objectively, I have a twenty-dollar bill in this hand. I have a one-dollar bill in this hand. Objectively, can anybody tell me why this is worth? 20 times this. Objectively, uh, we like twos a lot. Or, you know, there, the, the two has one, the two and the zero have two extra things. Okay? Is there any objective reason why this is worth 20 times this? The short answer is no. It's the way we think. It's all about changing the way we think. So, what we want to do is make this coal and this solar. And all of a sudden, the need for incentives goes away. Economics, the right thing that solves our planet, our species' existence on this planet, is automatically the most profitable thing to do. So then we don't have to worry about it. We don't have to charge $5 a, a, a bag for a thing, because we will naturally, as part of our day-to-day -day business, do it. Why should we have to justify economically anything that makes us survive on the planet? Okay. So anyway, in the, in the, in the um, Battle between chemistry, biology, physics.
physics, economics, politics, and habit, it's obvious which one is going to win. It's our choice to integrate with nature, not an accident. So it's we have to do it ourselves. And uh, again, if we're wrong, and uh, okay, so I'm going to stop there. We can talk about this later. I'll leave this up.
Then finally, uh, to change the way we think, that's not so difficult for us, for each one of us. That's difficult for us in terms of community, in terms of country, in terms of global relations between nations. This is what's becoming more and more difficult. Actually, I will be a member of one of the delegations that are going to Copenhagen. It's a lost cause. We'll get nowhere there. But it's an interesting, uh, interesting dialogue when you see scientists uh, led by a fantastic group of people who won, like Professor Owen won, uh, a Nobel Prize, the IPCC, something like 1,500 uh, scientists moving toward uh, measuring the effects of global climate and the final in the final uh, late news is that from the loss of, uh, of uh, mountain glaciers and Arctic ice to the acidification of oceans, the impact of climate change is coming faster and sooner. Okay, there we have a problem. There we have a problem and what are the incentives? Did you also told us something about uh, mitigation and adaptation, you know what that means. Mitigation is when you have a prospective view of what's going to happen and you do it before. Adaptation means we have to live with it and when we have to live with it, it can be really hardship and it will have to change all our way of life. So I propose that from now on we'll discuss either among ourselves or we receive from you some incentives for further discussions. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, please. Do you mind saying the name and uh, my name is uh, Rick Harris. Well no, I think we have a we have a do we have a
understand our place in the food chain. And if we want to continue as a species, we've got to learn to fit in and not take other species with us. And that's only, we, and, and the only way we're going to do that is to align our human activities with the business of the planet, which is chemistry, biology, and physics. I think that uh, what you are asking for uh, would require uh, Professor Owen giving us a little bit more uh, in depth approach on what the incentives could be for us to change. I think it's very important. Uh, Dr. Flagan asked me uh, uh, privately, uh, what does this have to do with game theory? Well, you're, you're an expert in game theory. You're, you're not an ecologist or a what does this have to do with game theory? So it, it, Game theory is incentives, ladies and gentlemen. That's what it's all about. You know, when you uh, uh, game theory is about people interacting with each other, and if they want to do this in a way which is good for them, they have to give the other players in the game an incentive to do what you want to do. You have to give them an incentive to, uh, uh, for example, if you're buying a house, okay, it's a game. The game between the seller and the buyer. Um, you, you, the, the seller wants to give the buyer an incentive to pay a higher price, so you'll show him all the good things about the house. That, that's what games are about. Games are about incentives. So uh, I was really selling my stuff over here, I guess. Uh, let, let me go into a little more detail about, um, about the. Uh, Okay, we recognize that too. Uh, we'll go a little more into a little more detail about how these incentives would work. Uh, let me give uh, an example on um, our energy. All right, we, we talked about water. We talked about energy. Yes, it's very simple. Yes, uh, the you want to have the development of alternative forms of energy, solar energy and so on. So right now solar energy is too expensive. Why is solar energy expensive? The sun is out there in the air, right? We see it every day. Uh, so so uh, the sun is cheap, it's free, right? Uh, that's, what we're, that's what we saw on the, uh, on the uh, PowerPoint presentation before. The sun is free, but it's not free because you have to develop methods to harness the energy of the sun. That's expensive, all right? And it's so expensive, in fact, that it's not worth one, right? A few years ago, my boiler broke down, okay? The old electric coal fuel boiler broke down. So I, I, uh, I said, okay, everybody in Israel has these uh, solar uh, water heaters. Let's go into a solar water heater. And I started investigating it. It turned out that the capital cost of the so the, you know, once it's in there, um, once it's in there, it's free. You know, the sun shines on the solar water heater, you get the energy for nothing. But what about the solar water heater itself, okay? So it turns out that the interest that I would have to pay, or the, the, the cost over time of the solar water heater, would, was more expensive than all the electricity I would have to pay for 15 years with a conventional boiler. I said, the hell with that, I'm going to buy a conventional boiler. Because, it, you know, I try to be good, but not when it costs too much, yes? So, so I put in a conventional heater. Yeah, I, I, it's, uh, I have to confess to it, yes. Uh, and there are other people like me also, yeah. They, they want to have bread and butter, yes, in addition to saving the world. So, uh, so what has to be done, what has to be done is to make the conventional electricity more expensive, okay? In other words, raise the price of that. Raise the price of oil. It's very, very simple. Raise the price of oil. Raise the price of of uh, of uh, uh, coal, uh, of, uh, of electricity. You can just say, yeah, bring it up, all right? So you, uh, and then people will have the incentive to 
develop uh, ways to develop technologies to harness solar energy. You have to give them the incentive to harness solar energy. Let me get to it. That you're not going to get people to invest in that if everybody is going to uh, behave like a soil man who, who uh, made a calculation and decided it's worthwhile then to buy the old style of boiler. Yeah? Okay? So you have to make it more expensive. Yes. That will give a <coughs> that will give an incentive. It's a double incentive. First of all for your soil homeland to buy the solar water here. But also for, for, for the for the companies that are um, that are developing this technology. Yeah? Because a committee like Netanyahu suggested yesterday is very beautiful. Let me tell you a story about that. Uh, it's, it's, you know, back in 1970, I'm a pretty old guy myself, but I remember 1970 very well. Most of the people in this room are too young for that. But uh, in 1970, President Nixon had this poverty program, the War on Poverty, okay? And it was a big program, and, and uh, a lot of uh, effort was put into it. And one of my friends, an economist, said, Bob, let's get into poverty. That's where the money is. <laughs> <laughs> so let's get into energy. That's where the money is. But, but we have to put the money there, okay? We have to make an incentive to... to uh, we have to build incentives for the industrial world to invest in creating these technologies. And I think Netanyahu is right. The technologies are there. Let me say something else about water, okay? Water is too cheap. Okay? You want to save water, raise the price. So you say some people are poor. They need water and they can't afford a higher price. Sure, some people are poor, but a lot of people are rich. And the rich people waste the water, okay? Water should have one price, one price in, in any locality, yes? Uh, and, and it should be high enough to get people not to waste water. It's very simple. Let me give you another example. Uh, right now, we have a situation where the roads are clogged in, in, uh, in the morning rush hour and in the evening rush hour. And the cars are sitting there in the uh, uh, traffic jams and they're emitting gas all the day, emitting emissions all the time. And it's, a, it's an ecological and environmental disaster, okay? What do you do in order to prevent that? Well, one thing you could do is not to have a rush hour, okay? Maybe to, to, uh, to spread the time that people work, whatever, yeah? How do you get people either to take public transportation or to, uh, or to, to, to go to work at a different time. I try to avoid rush hours, okay? Uh, um, how, how do you do that? Well, it's very simple. You just do, you have lanes for public transportation only. Or you have lanes for carpools which have at least two people in the car, three people in the car, four people in the car. Or, or both, yes? Or you could close roads. In, in the certain way, you could close roads to private transportation. You have to get to work at a certain time. You've got to do it. Take a cab. A cab is public transportation, okay? If it costs you, you're not going to do it. Thank you very much. Oh, beautiful, Pastor. Thank you. So, uh, if I understand well, uh, we have positive incentive and negative. So, is the perspective of catastrophic event a positive or a negative? It's not. It's not an incentive. Let me explain that to you. It's not. It's not an incentive at all because you. It's not like the Titanic. Okay. This this explanation of the Titanic was beautiful because each one of the people could get into the lifeboat. He didn't do it. All right. So there was an incentive for him. But there's no way that Yisrael Oman is going to change the world, yes, 
there's no way that he is going to prevent the disaster. An incentive has to be in the end of the story. And it's quite nice reading. And one of their features is cartoons. They have very clever cartoons. And there was this cartoon that was way back then in the 50s, yes. And they had this cartoon. This guy is driving along one of the roads in Arizona. And it's totally empty and full of desert, yes. And he one says to the other, look at all that space. Why can't we build a parking lot over here? Okay. So, I mean, if we all move to the negative, yes, then we could, uh, then there might be a parking shortage over there, and we might be able to use the, uh, the solar energy over there. The problem is that people don't want to uh, move to the negative, unless you give them incentives, okay? You could, you could, you, you could make electricity, so it's not enough to say, move to the negative, yes? You, uh, yeah, you have to, you have to give people an incentive to move to the negative. Now, if you make electricity so much more expensive in Tel Aviv than in uh, uh, Dimona, then people will move to Dimona, okay? So, uh, it, it, there's, uh, you've got to give them the reason for this. I'm in favor of the negative. I love the negative. I'm telling my sisters, I went to, uh, and took, a, I, I, um, by the way, I did something very uh, non, non-environmental recently. I bought a 4x4 four four car. <laughs> I've always wanted a 4x4 four four car. My whole life, finally when I'm almost 80, I buy it. Yes. Okay. So, I bought a 4x4 four four car, and I went down to Nachal Chabai in the Negev, and I drove 20 kilometers on a dirt road, which is only possible. So, and, and, and it's a beautiful place, I love it. I would build my house in Nachal Chaba if there were other people around, but there weren't any, yes. So, it, it, you, you've got to have the right incentive. I just, you, you underscore my point. Let's go to the negative by all means, but, but you have to have the, the incentives for that. That's your answer. I don't know, I don't know if I satisfy you.
and uh, I've heard you before, and you were mentioning a Copenhagen conference. Uh, I'm going to be there also. I'm also going to be a part of the Israeli delegation. And I've heard you are very pessimistic about the, the Copenhagen the conference. Yeah. No? What's the <laughs> so the question is, <laughs> the question is, uh, what are your expectations for, uh, from that uh, conference in Copenhagen? Can we be optimistic about it uh, as a country, Israel as a country, a developed country? And uh, not a developing one, of course. And uh, what are uh, your expectations uh, uh, the international uh, agreement that is going to be there if there is a. Uh, I'd like to hear uh, the opinion of, uh, uh, of your and the, the other uh, members of the panel. Thank you. Well, Copenhagen doesn't stand by itself. Copenhagen is a follow up of Kyoto. Kyoto Protocol ended uh, in 2010. So what we are going to negotiate is the past Kyoto. Kyoto Protocol was basically uh, a financial system or a market system through which there was, it was supposed to regulate the outflow of carbon and, uh, and the conservation needed to equalize the absorption. It didn't happen. Kyoto was a failure. It was a good, it was a good system as a test, but it, it did not operate to the final product that it was searching was curbing the emissions. Actually, the emissions grew by a very fast, uh, by a very large amount of percentage. What do we expect in Copenhagen? Uh, we expect from some countries a very positive answer, which are mainly the European Union. Uh, they are supposed to propose an increase of uh, diminishing emissions, yearly emissions by 30%, which will uh, most probably will take us, to take the European Union to the level of 1990, which is the basic, uh, the basic uh, platform that we are searching for. Why I don't believe that uh, Copenhagen will answer? Because Copenhagen is just a market device. I mean, the post Kyoto is a market device. And you know that we have many other problems that uh, are not market related. And those problems have been discussed here. We have the problem of climate is an effect. What is the cause? Is the use of fossil fuel. So we have an energy problem. We have a problem of efficiency because discussed here. We have a water problem, uh, we have a biodiversity problem, and most probably one solution that will come out of, uh, of uh, Copenhagen will be, uh, will be a resolution on forests, on deforestation, which is already quite something, considering that deforestation worth something like 18% of the total emissions of the planet. So uh, that's not going to answer the problem either. So, what we are discussing here, look, I began my, my life as an anarchist, so I hate governments, <laughs> and I think that governments will lead us nowhere. So it's up to we, people, not to absorb the awareness, but to follow up what Professor Uman just said, produce incentives and oblige governments to behave according to what we want not what they want us to do. So I think this is what we expect from Copenhagen. Governments that are represented there will not give us a solution. We have to give us a solution. Yes, please. mitigation, adaptation, and suffering, when I asked why the Nicholas Stern study didn't change the paradigm of thinking of governments or very much individuals, wouldn't there be a similar kind of study to be made on the suffering of individuals so that people would be, have the incentive to get moving and to change their volume, and not just an economic study, a suffering study? Well, I guess, you know, one of the blessings and curses of being human is that our time on this planet is, is so fundamentally short compared to you know, the effects that we've set into motion. Uh, we're just not capable right now of thinking you know, beyond, in some cases, the next quarter. Um, again, I think we're going to need to you know, get a, a very severe spanking as a species from the planet before we learn how to live in harmony with it. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm optimistic 
did. Noah didn't talk about building the ark. He just went out and did it. And that's honestly what we all have to do. Yes, the Titanic is sinking, but it's our job every day to go out and build lifeboats. Okay, because that's you know that's that is the radical confidence. That's our vision of the future. That humans will survive. It might we may be surviving under different conditions, but we have to put people in the life jackets and we have to build lifeboats. That's that's the heroic response. And that's what we need. We need a generation of heroes. I have one more question. Uh, I have one more question just uh, to uh, comment and see if we can uh, bring a new factor here. Um, we're talking about incentives. But the, the thing is that in the case of incentives, you have rich countries, poor countries. In rich countries, people in their salary they will only put a small percentage of their salary into energy. In poor countries, it will go up to 50% in some, ca some cases. So when you start talking about incentive increasing the price of the energy, the impact on these rich countries are going to be less. And they will not have the impact that we're waiting for. It's not an incentive. Just like in, in the United States, the oil price has increased, People start still using their cars. No change, basically, in their lifestyle. It impacted the poor countries, but the poor countries are not the ones that are creating the problem. So, so we have to be very, very careful with incentives. Second is, what is the impact of education? Because we have not really talked about education here. Is education getting people to be aware of the problems? Considering that there's globalization, where you know all this information is available, can that have an impact on all these type of things?
we ecologists, we are trying to organize, fix our own house. Then to the final word, I will give you a wording by Antoine saint exupéry You all read the Petit Prince. He said, uh, we did not inherit the earth from our parents. We took it as a loan from our children. Thank you very much. <laughs>